The Bay Area's history of particle accelerator research began on the UC Berkeley campus in 1930, when 29-year-old physicist Ernest Lawrence designed a circular particle accelerator. Now here we have a, um, a mechanical model of the cyclotron, which perhaps might be helpful in understanding how it works. There are uh, two semi-circular electrodes in the vacuum chamber of the cyclotron, uh, which, uh, so to speak, move up and down in potential. Here we have two plates that move up and down in potential, and the particles are generated here at the center, so if they start here, and this is up, and, and this half is down, they will go across downhill and pick up energy. And uh, we'll start it off. Here it's up, here it's down, 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 down. The two are going up and down, so the particle always crosses the region between downhill, and therefore the particles spiral out on ever-widening circles, finally coming to the periphery where they strike the target. His cyclotron was a breakthrough because without requiring much energy, it could produce very energetic particles in a small space. Up until that point, the energies were so low that it was hard to excite uh, nuclei and really see what they're made of. What do they do when they spin up? What do they do when they heat up? Lawrence's first cyclotron fit in the palm of his hand. The machine's second iteration fit on a table. To get the charged particles moving fast, Lawrence bent them into a circular path using two magnets like this one. Then he gave the particles regular pushes to increase their velocity. The cyclotron reached an energy level that allowed Lawrence and his colleagues to easily investigate the nucleus of an atom for the first time. To do this, they bombarded charged particles against different elements. By adding protons to the target nucleus, they created new elements. During World War II, Lawrence turned the cyclotron into a device that could separate out the type of uranium necessary to produce the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. It is a legacy of nuclear physics that our forefathers were instrumental in making nuclear weapons possible. And now we, we live with that for good or for bad. Besides helping usher in the atomic age, they inaugurated the field of nuclear medicine. In fact, most cancer patients who undergo radiation therapy today do so in an accelerator. For his invention of the cyclotron, Lawrence received the 1939 Nobel Prize in Physics. A negatively charged hydrogen ion is injected into the vacuum chamber of the cyclotron, where two D-shaped plates are enclosed between the poles of a powerful electromagnet. An alternating positive and negative voltage between the Ds attracts and repels the ion in a circular path from one D to the other. The ion gets a boost in energy every time it crosses the gap between the Ds, causing it to accelerate. The magnetic field holds the ion within a horizontal plane, causing the ion to spiral toward the outside of the cyclotron as it accelerates. When the ion hits the extraction foil, it is stripped of its electrons, leaving a positively charged proton that then travels down a beam line toward a target. When the high energy proton collides with the nucleus of an atom in the target, a nuclear reaction changes the atom's structure, creating a radioisotope. The radioisotope is then added to a molecule, in this case, a sugar molecule, making a radiopharmaceutical that can easily be absorbed by the human body. The target material containing the radioisotope is transferred from the end station via shielded lines and a series of pass-through access ports to a hot cell in the production area. Once in the hot cell, the operator uses the manipulating arms to extract the radioisotope from the target. Time is of the essence, as the radioisotope has already started to decay. While the radioisotope decays, it releases energy. It is this energy that is detected by the PET-CT. Radiopharmaceuticals produced at the cyclotron facility 
like all pharmaceutical production in Canada, must follow strict and rigorous protocols and adhere to the quality assurance process of Health Canada's good manufacturing practices. These protocols ensure that this centre has qualified and trained personnel, adequate premises and facilities, and correct materials and labels, while adhering to approved procedures to ensure the production of safe, high-quality radiopharmaceuticals. The radiopharmaceutical is packaged and placed into a shielded container to be transported to a hospital or used in a laboratory. Upon arrival at Royal University Hospital, the radiopharmaceutical is prepared to be intravenously injected into the patient. As it travels throughout the patient's body, the radioisotope decays. It releases energy that is detected by the PET-CT scanner and used to generate three-dimensional images. The images reveal locations in the body where cells are taking up the most radioisotope. The more active the cells, the more radioisotope they absorb. The National Farm and Home Hour from the Berkeley campus of the University of California. Uh, but Dr. Lawrence, Henry's told us about all these new discoveries of yours with the 75 and the 225-ton cyclotrons. Uh, what do you need a great monster of 4,900 tons for? Well, Jennings, uh, you see, we've created valuable new substances and produced new forms of energy, well, such as the neutron ray, but, but we still can't completely smash an atom. For that, we need a 4,900-ton machine. Well, what's so important about smashing a little atom, anyway? Well, I think I can answer part of that, Jennings. For one thing, with the 4,900-ton cyclotron, it may be possible to change any element into another at will and then create valuable new substances to order. That would give us complete mastery over the physical world. <laughs> but there's even a greater goal, Henry. Oh, you mean the release of atomic power? <laughs> That's right. You see, the nucleus of an atom makes up 99% of its weight, and within that nucleus is locked up a tremendous fund of energy. And do you think that this 4,900-ton uh, machine will be able to release it? Well, Henry, uh, according to our calculations, it will. Harnessing the atomic power will be another problem. But science has performed what seemed to be miracles before, and, well, I feel sure we will someday be able to put atomic power to practical use. Well, that is a story. Thanks for giving us your time, Dr. Lawrence. <laughs> Not at all. Come back in three years, and I'll show you the new machine in operation. That's the date. Goodbye, Dr. Lawrence. Half a century ago, Europe's scientific community came together to found a laboratory for particle physics in an attempt to bring about a new renaissance in European research. Adding their weight to its formation were the leading physicists of the day. Le célèbre professeur danois Niels Bohr, son collègue britannique Sir George Thomson, l'allemand Dr. Werner Heisenberg et les plus illustres atomistes des principaux pays d'Europe, pour la France, le haut commissaire à l'énergie atomique Francis Perrin, successeur de M. Joliot-Curie. Their mission was no less than to understand the ultimate nature of the material world that makes up our universe. The Second World War had not long ended, and it was felt that such an endeavor would help bring warring nations together and attract European scientists to stay in Europe. Le prix Nobel de physique, M. Félix Bloch, a présidé la cérémonie de la pose de la première pierre de l'Institut européen pour la recherche nucléaire. Grande date dans l'histoire de l'Europe. The acronym CERN is born. Important decisions are taken in the first sessions of the new council. Geneva is chosen as the seat because of its central location in Europe and its international tradition. Two accelerators are put forward, the synchro cyclotron and a much larger machine, the proton synchrotron. A new convention to find CERN's goal stating that its research will have no concern with military requirements and that all its results should be made public. The CERN convention is signed by 12 nations. Among the signatories are eminent physicists such as Werner Heisenberg. CERN comes into existence. 1954. 
On a site in Mehran, a small village near Geneva, work for the new laboratory begins. Within a year, the farmland is transformed into a large complex of workshops, offices and buildings to house the new accelerators. The five metre thick walls of the synchro cyclotron building soon emerge. While the different parts of the new accelerators are manufactured in several European countries. The synchro cyclotron's magnet coils require particular care to pass through some of the Swiss villages on their way to Milan. By the mid-1950s, local villagers were getting a taste of the sheer scale of what was going on. The first of CERN's epic transport operations was underway. Operations that now have become part of their lives. Progress was relentless in penetrating deeper into the secrets of matter. In 1959 came the proton synchrotron. Moment historique, mise en marche du plus puissant briseur d'atomes du monde, mise au point par un savant du CERN, projette une bouteille de champagne contre le mur de protection de l'anneau du synchrotron, dont la mise en marche est symbolisée par des effets de lumière. Monsieur Oppenheimer, des États-Unis. The PS fired a single beam of protons into a target and is still in use today as a feeder for larger instruments. By applying greater energies and developing precision instruments to capture and analyze transient events, an increasingly large menagerie of elementary particles began to emerge. The Electra Laboratory is located not very far from Trieste, on the Carso near the town of Bazovica. It was built to produce an exceptionally bright light, synchrotron radiation, a tool that enables researchers to detect structural details of materials otherwise invisible. This tool has many applications in different fields. Let's have a look at the source of this light with such exceptional features. Everything starts in the booster that shoots electrons and accelerates them at extremely high energy. An electron source is located in the first part of the booster. Here, charged particles are admitted by a metal electrode using a principle similar to that operating in the cathode ray tube of a standard television set. The electrons are guided inside a thin, circular, high vacuum steel tube of 120 meters circumference through intense electromagnetic fields. They are then accelerated to 2.5 billion electron volt. The electrons are shot like cannonballs from the booster into the transfer line and finally injected into the storage ring 260 meters long. Here they will circle for 24 hours without interruption, almost at the speed of light, and their energy will remain constant. During this time span, they will cover a distance equivalent to four times the diameter of the solar system. Synchrotron light is generated in the storage ring. The ring is, in fact, an alternation of straight and curved sections. In each curved section, a powerful magnet guides the electrons, forcing them to deviate from their path. Each time they deviate, the electrons emit energy in the form of light. The beams of light tangent to the storage ring are conveyed into the beam lines where the experiments are performed. Today, Electra has 23 operating beam lines, each specialized in a different field of measurement. This allows a broad variety of materials to be analyzed. The applications range widely from chemistry to biology, electronics, environmental science, materials engineering, medicine, nanotechnology, and archaeology. For example, the X-ray diffraction beam line allows us to study the structure of viruses and proteins by locating their atoms in space. Like all the other beam lines, the X-ray diffraction station includes various optical devices that select the needed wavelength and terminates with the experimental chamber where the sample is located. The light, in this case X-rays, interacts with the sample, for example, a protein, in a particular way, according to the position of the atoms. This phenomenon is called diffraction. 
The diffracted X-rays form an image that can be seen by means of a detector. This image contains all the structural information of the sample. Using a particular software based on the principles of physics and mathematics, the researchers are then able to uncover the three-dimensional structure of the protein atom by atom. In their effort to discover smaller and smaller levels of matter, physicists built ever more fanciful accelerators. In 1962 in Menlo Park, construction began on the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. At two miles, its accelerator was the longest in the world. Linear accelerators, also referred to as LINACs, push particles in a straight line as opposed to a circle. When it turned on in 1966, the new LINAX mission was to find out what was inside the protons and neutrons that make up the atom's nucleus. This new question would require a new type of accelerator. Physicist Burton Richter pioneered the idea of a collider and in 1972 built one attached to the Stanford LINAC. Instead of smashing particles against a stationary target, as the LINAC did, the so-called Spear Collider smashed beams of accelerated particles against each other. Modern particle accelerators have grown so large that they no longer fit inside regular buildings. Instead, the particles travel through an underground tunnel that forms a ring so large it can only be seen from high above. The 1960s, 70s, and 80s saw a relentless increase in the size and sophistication of the experiments, always pushing technology and human ingenuity to the limit. With unstoppable momentum, CERN had already begun what was at the time Europe's biggest civil engineering project, the Large Electron-Positron Collider, the LEP. Deep underground, 27 kilometers in circumference, straddling both Switzerland and France, it would be the Lord of the Rings. In spite of its size, the LEPS instruments had to be constructed to an accuracy of 0.1 of a millimeter and even allow for the small tidal movement in the surrounding rocks as the moon passes overhead. In seeking answers to questions about the universe, CERN is building the largest, most powerful collider the world has ever known. So powerful, that at the moment of particle impact, hitherto unimaginable temperatures will be reached. How will they achieve this? Using the 27-kilometer tunnel that contained the LEP, the Large Hadron Collider, known as the LHC, will use a battering ram nearly 2,000 times more massive than the old electron and positron. The proton. Responding to a massive electrical kick, the proton, having an electrical charge, begins to accelerate. Moving in the opposite direction are other protons, traveling in an adjacent tube. By the time the proton has been accelerated by a linear accelerator, gained energy circulating around two synchrotrons, and been injected into the Large Hadron Collider, its speed is approaching the speed of light. In this apocalyptic jousting tournament, the lead proton is not alone. Each proton group numbers more than 100,000 million. In one of the LHC's four giant underground detector caverns, their two paths converge as their Armageddon approaches. The energies created at collisions in the LHC 
have never occurred since the Big Bang itself, and some of the particles released have not roamed free since that time. It's then the task of the LHC's massive detectors to try and unravel the shower of debris from these collisions. This demands computer power hitherto unseen on the planet. Wolfgang von Ruden heads a team pushing the pace to the limit to provide the computational power needed by the LHC at switch-on in 2007. The uh, amount of data we're going to generate at LHC is enormous. If you look at the total amount of information produced worldwide, the LHC itself will produce about 1% of the total information of the whole world. We are expecting by the year 2007 to have something like in the order of 5,000 PCs of the fastest model. Now this is only at CERN. But then you will have the same amount in all these various computer centers around the world. We are talking about at least 10 to 12 large computer centers and maybe 50 to 70 smaller computer centers. This new supercomputing network will be known as the GRID. Indeed, the computing needs of high energy physics always exceeds the existing technology. To service the needs of the LEP in the 1990s, CERN created the World Wide Web, now part of our daily lives. Who knows what benefits the grid will bring? The Large Hadron Collider, so big that its 17-mile underground tunnel straddles the border between Switzerland and France. Activated in 2008, it cost billions of dollars and involves 13,000 scientists and students from 50 countries. They're trying to further our understanding of some of the most basic questions of physics. What's the atom made of? It's made of a nucleus and electron. What's the nucleus made of? It's made of a proton and a neutron. What are the proton and neutrons made of? They're made of quarks. What's the quark made of? We don't know. Since the 1930s, physicists in Northern California have played key roles in finding answers to these questions and in building particle accelerators that paved the way for the Large Hadron Collider. One thing with the 4900 turn cyclotron, it may be possible to change any element into another at will and then create valuable new substances to order. That would give us complete mastery over the physical world. The largest single machine in the world. It was engineered by the European Organization for Nuclear Research, CERN, between 1998 and 2008. CERN has a very distinctive relation with Lord Shiva, one among the three deities in Hindu mythology. Brahma the creator, Vishnu the preserver, and Shiva the destroyer. CERN has the stay of Nataraja one among the form of Lord Shiva at its headquarters gate. What is fascinating is Nataraja is the form of Shiva while he's performing the Tandav, the dance of destruction and there is no creation without destruction. As an indication of destruction, Lord Shiva suppressed the past Mara by stamping and standing on him with one leg. One thing which is very fascinating is Vedic literature and symbols have the knowledge of subatomic particles. Our ancestors knew the details of the subatomic particles, about whole range of subatomic particles and mighty entities and energies like black holes, neutron stars, stars, dark matter, dark energy, space-time continuum and whole of the universe and beyond, about multi-dimensions of space. The world's biggest accelerator is over five miles in diameter. This new machine is predicted to be capable of crushing atoms together to form the first artificial black hole. Maybe possible to change any element into another at will and then create valuable new substances to order. That would give us complete mastery over the physical world. So at the moment we have the uh, Large Hadron Collider, LHC. We achieved discovery of the Higgs boson. The future Circular Collider, FCC, will be the next instrument 
that we have to build if we want to continue to be in the path of discovery. Uh, plan for a post-LHC era. The motivation for what we are doing is basically curiosity. There's no clear hint on where nature could hide its secrets. To explore more intense collisions, we need a bigger collider. Physically, it's a much longer tunnel. This future circular collider, we're looking at a tunnel 80 to 100 kilometers. Basically, what we can fit into the Geneva Basin. With FCC, we can go much, much further. We will need all the people of CERN, but all the people also worldwide. Science knows no borders. There is a lot more to, to learn still, and we have to. If we stop exploring, then, then basically we, we stop evolving. Discovery of the Higgs boson was a big deal, but this is only the beginning of the story. We've scratched the surface, but we, we, we have clearly much more to, to discover. the end of the LINAC, its final energy of 160 MeV. We are very excited about that. Now we can really start tuning. It's really the start after a long sleep. We are very happy that we are the first ones that start up this new Run 3 for the LHC. Start of the long sleep with the long sleep.